Welcome to MTN Outdoors. Welcome everybody to this week's episode of MTN Outdoors. I'm once again your guide, Andy Curtis. And make sure those hiking boots are laced up tight and also make sure you did your stretches. You're going to want to be good and limber for today's episode because we have got a lot of ground to cover. From Red Lodge where we'll meet a Montana man who doesn't let anything, and I really mean anything, stop him from hitting the slopes. We'll then turn our attention skyward and find out the science behind why we've had such spectacular northern light shows across the state here recently. But first, we're going to start here in the capital city with both feet firmly planted on the ground. And you landowners out there, did you know that there's a few programs that you can use to make a little extra cash and help poor schmucks like me expand my hunting range? That's right, Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks are calling on all Montana landowners to submit applications for enrollment in the Unlocking Public Lands Program or the Public Access Land Agreement Program. Now these programs are designed to provide public access for recreation to state or federal land where minimal legal public access is granted. In the UPL program, landowners can receive a tax credit of $750 per agreement and a max of $3,000 for access to private lands, roads, or trails. In the PALA program, landowners will receive compensation for possible infrastructure like gravel, culvers, and cattle guards, just to name a few. Now, compensation varies, but can range to up to $15,000 each, with one landowner holding multiple contracts. Head on over to the FWP website for more information. And there are other programs out there if that one doesn't exactly float your boat. Or should I say, cross your cattle guard. The Montana Department of Livestock has announced 10 meetings across Montana to introduce cattle ranchers to the fundamentals of secure beef supply, otherwise known as SBS. Now this is a vital tool to help ranchers re-enter business following a hypothetical severe disease outbreak like foot and mouth disease. The plans have a specific outline of measures that ranchers can employ to minimize the risk of contracting or spreading a disease. The Department of Livestock has set aside funding for 20 producers to create individualized SBS plans. And for questions on this or how to sign up, you can check out the link on our website, ktvh.com, for more information. And the Montana Department of Agriculture is now accepting applications for the Food and Agriculture Development Center Grant Program. It's offering upwards of $1.1 million in funds for the two-year grant, and it plans to award multiple grants. Activities must develop Montana's food processing infrastructure, support emerging agricultural technologies, or enhance opportunities to expand Montana's agricultural economy. Now, the application deadline for this one is May 1st, at 5 o'clock p.m. All right, let's stick around the ranch for this next story. And every year, there's always something new that you can learn about calving. And if you're a producer that needs just a little extra help getting your meat to market, there is some assistance now available. MTN's Ryan Gamboa has our story. To get your cow herd to market, a lot goes into keeping them healthy to the way that you're supplementing or the technology that you're using. Fergus County MSU Extension Office offered producers a calving workshop. If you missed it, pre and post calving health is essential. Body condition, um, just monitoring that pre calving and post calving so we can get into breeding season because um, it really affects uh, colostrum and milk quality for those calves and getting that quality calf on the ground. With options on the market, Megan Van Emmen, Extension Beef Specialist, explains. We're looking at those commercial supplements, um, lick tubs, alfalfa cake. Like most bulking diets, especially in pre-calving, protein is the name of the game. Protein is our pre-calving um, concern because we're usually on low quality pastures. We're feeding some, some decent quality hay, but we're trying to get them into calving season um, where we're going to really focus on those high nutrient demands of lactation. And so then we start worrying about the energy because that energy draw is huge for milk production. Natural proteins including soybean meal and cottonseed meal versus a non-protein nitrogen like urea or Bayou Red. Non-protein nitrogen is only available in the rumen. Then it goes to the microbes and then the microbes provide the protein to the cow. 
Whereas if we feed more of a natural source, yes, those microbes will get their protein need met, but then you're also providing a, um, more protein into the small intestine directly from the feed source itself. Now to post calving. This is the time when I usually recommend, you know, reducing some of that straw to the diet if you, um, and focusing more on maybe a decent quality alfalfa, you know, that 13, 14% protein. Making sure your cattle stay full is most important. To help alleviate the round the clock burden comes new technology, including activity sensors. Activity ear tags, Sam Weifels explains. Or it would then send a, a uh, cellular or, or alarm or, or email to a producer to let them know that that individual cow is likely calving. The price tag might be a concern, but Sam says that as technology becomes more accessible, price tags tend to decrease. This might be a way to help get youth reinvigorated in agriculture and um, get them back to the ranch and getting them more interested in technology and improvements and, and things and looking at the wave of the future in the beef cattle industry. For more information or resources from the MSU Extension Office, you can visit this link on our website. In Lewistown, Ryan Gamboa, MTN News. And since we're talking about being outside in our national parks, hiking, sightseeing in general, this is a perfect time to shift gears and move on over to our MTN Outdoors Trivia Question of the Week. And for this one, I had to get a little help from the Montana Department of Ag, because this question involves something that we should all know a lot more about, but honestly, probably very few of us do. So here we go. Which of these weeds are considered noxious and abundant by the state of Montana? Is it A, white prairie clover, B, spotted knapweed, or C, Lewis flax? Now this is another real head scratcher this week, so I don't blame you if you need to try and Google it real quick, but think about it. Really let that idea grow on you as you enjoy these great commercials and we'll have your answer when we come back. We now return to MTN Outdoors. Welcome back everybody. Now before the break I asked you this week's MTN Outdoors trivia question and I don't blame you if you had to google it. It's a tough one, a little tougher than last week's but uh, I'll make it up to you and uh, ask a real easy one next week. But until then if you need to see it one more time, here it is. Which of these weeds are considered noxious and abundant by the state of Montana? Is it A, white prairie clover, B, spotted knapweed, or C, Lewis flax? Like I said, this is a hard one, so no shame in getting it wrong this week. Just think of it as a learning opportunity. And if you answered B, spotted knapweed, then you know your noxious weeds. Montana has 36 state listed noxious weed species that can be found on about 8.2 million acres of the treasure state. Now these non-native species impact wildlife habitat by competing for space, nutrients, and water with our native plants, which could cause problems for the biodiversity of our ecosystems. So that's not good at all. Now, if you want a good resource for noxious weed identification, check out the Montana Department of Agriculture's website. Stopping the spread of noxious weeds here in Montana is an uphill battle for sure. But some people really love uphill battles, especially if it leads to a little downhill fun. MTN's Casey Conlin introduces us to one of those people in Red Lodge. You can find lots of stories here at Red Lodge Mountain, and you can usually make lots of friends on a ski lift. The one I've made today, Howard Marquardt. And Howard is a bit of a local celebrity here because at 84, he is still carving up the slopes. What's it like skiing with Howard? It's like looking at the back of someone getting further away from you. For almost 20 years, Howard Marquardt has been teaching this group of diehard skiers a thing or two. We skied fast. He was always first one down the mountain. He's 16 years older than me and I still have not beat him on a race yet. There we go. Howard has a little edge. He's been skiing longer than most have been alive. 73 years. That's all? That's all. <laughs> He's been an expert for almost all of them. First skiing in college, then racing for most of his adult life. He's usually near the front of the pack in the Red Lodge Town Series on Fridays. But he wasn't this day because he's working his way back from a small setback. And then I have, that's an inner socket. 
I had a benign tumor in the talus bone of my right ankle and uh, it turned malignant so the only option was to amputate in the boot and the, and the foot. Howard had his lower right leg amputated on April 22nd last year. His first question afterwards? How long after did you ask, well, can I still ski? Immediately. <laughs> he got his first prosthesis on July 8th and was riding a bike four days later. But that was just a warm up. Ski season usually starts the day after Thanksgiving. So when did Howard first give it a go? The day after Thanksgiving. From day one, even with the tumor, he's always said he will always ski. So there, there was no question. When I heard what he was dealing with, it was like, he's going to come out of this and he'll still be racing. I had no doubt in my mind. We're still going to try to carry speed. Howard is still figuring out how to navigate this new feeling, or lack of feeling. I have a tough time initiating a left-hand turn because I don't have as much feel in my right leg. Woohoo! You did great. My next challenge is to get back on a to get back on a race ski. But even now, anybody would have a tough time keeping up. The first day he came up, I, I was skiing behind him to see how he was gonna do to him. And I had to push it to stay right behind him. He was flying. He looks like he always did when he's skiing down the hill. He's so good. I was so impressed when I was skiing with him. I'm just going, oh my God, he's got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For most skiers, an amputation at 84 years old would be a big enough sign to give it up. But Howard isn't most skiers. How long are you going to keep skiing? How long am I going to keep skiing? Yeah. <laughs> Until I can't. <laughs> and that day clearly hasn't come. In Red Lodge, Casey Conley, MTN News. Recent numbers show that more people than ever are participating in outdoor recreation. So that means places like ski resorts or hiking trails are getting pretty crowded. And if you're someone who lives with post-traumatic stress disorder, that means that you might have some more barriers between you and the mental health benefits of getting outside. Well, I met up with one organization who's made it their sole purpose to help people like that get outside in the healthiest way possible. Everyone grab their transceivers, pop them out. For these veterans, physical obstacles are something they take head on with pride. We're going to go up to where it starts to get um, questionable and we're just going to observe our way up. But it's the silent obstacles that can be the hardest to overcome. There's a lot of programs that support physically disabled veterans or traumatic brain injury specifically. But my friends that I lost were just veterans that had some mental health issues. So those scars were not really visible. And I recognized that and said, well, there's something I can do is share something that I found value in and share that with the greater community. Austin Brudiger is the reason this group is gathering together at this Colorado trailhead. He started High Country Veterans Adventures after experiencing the tragedy of losing friends to suicide and the peace he experienced out in nature. Weather today, you're looking at it, light snow. We like to sur surround ourselves with other veterans so we can have that kind of instant rapport. We can share things with ourselves that we may not feel comfortable sharing with other people. But out here, like, there's no, there's no filter needed, there's no judgment, and it really lets people open up. Studies have shown that the more time people diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder spend in the outdoors, the more they see a reduction in their PTSD symptoms. A recent study, though, by Penn State shows that now 50% of people in America participate in outdoor activities, a 20% increase from pre-pandemic times. While this means more people are getting yeah. more mental health benefits, crowded parks yeah. and expensive equipment can mean more barriers for people like veterans or others with PTSD exist. We've essentially removed the obstacles that prevent a veteran from coming out and enjoying these events. Austin's group moves some of those barriers by lending out equipment and providing avalanche training so veterans can access the pure wilderness of America's backcountry safely. But whatever you need will help you get it, whether it's short term or long term. So the gear, the space, the knowledge, the safety, we have that covered. We just need you to make contact and show up. Veteran Zach Whitmore found the group serendipitously a few years ago and says the ability to get outside with very few barriers has been life-changing. I just can't, I can't picture my life in any other way 
other than being in the mountains and being out in uh, in the in the wild with my friends. Connection through nature may be harder to find these days, but these enthusiasts say through proper knowledge and finding a group to show you the way the outdoors can remain one of the greatest healers available. Because at the end of the day, like we just want everybody to get up the mountain, finish the objective, and get down safely, and it brings it brings us together. And uh, it builds relationships. Vanessa Bishani, Scripps News, Summit County, Colorado. We now return to MTN Outdoors. Hey, welcome back, everybody, to MTN Outdoors. I'm Andy Curtis. Now, there are a few things that rat poison is really good at. The first thing that uh, comes to my mind is poisoning rats. But there are a few things that rat poison isn't so good at, namely, those poisoned rats making their way out into our ecosystem and a lot of our native wildlife getting poisoned by eating those poisoned rats. MTN's Tanner Saul explains. The earth is mainly covered by water, about 71% in fact, leaving only 29% of it to be land. And two thirds of those lands is now devoted directly to supporting us, either through agriculture, fisheries, urbanization, or infrastructure. And in the process, many native species have been pushed out. But there's one group of animals that has adapted better than any other. These little guys have been living alongside people since the days of the cavemen. And while they may not be everyone's favorite house guests, they've become an integral part of our lives. And with that integrating comes some bad, like the fact that rodents can carry diseases and destroy our food and property. In the winter alone, rodents invade 21 million U.S. homes. That's as much as the population of Florida. So for years, people have been trying to control them. And that's where chemicals come in. Chemical biocides called anticoagulants and rodenticides are known to us simply as rat poisons. And they're highly effective. But there's a catch. What we don't always see is that these poisons affect more than rats. Once an animal has ingested a lethal dose of rat poisons, death may not occur for up to 10 days. So although you may have applied the poison only in your home, the rat may run outside where it can become an easy snack for a predator. As animals eat rats that have ingested poisons, the poison concentrations increase as it moves up the food chain in a process called bioaccumulation. These toxins weaken immune systems and can eventually lead to death. One study by the California Fish and Game found high concentrations of rat poisons in bobcats, mountain lions, coyotes, foxes, skunks, hawks, and owls. These weakened immune systems by rat poisons are also linked to bobcats and mountain lions obtaining mange. In the wild, the strong survive, but sometimes even the toughest creatures face unexpected challenges. Meet P-47, a fierce and fearless mountain lion who had survived fires freeways and hostile landowners. But despite all that, the three-year-old big cat tracked by California biologists since his kitten days succumbed to a hidden hazard, an insidious form of food poisoning. Six compounds of rat poisons were found in P47's liver. He didn't have to consume rat bait directly to become ill. As apex predators, mountain lions inadvertently absorb the toxins through their natural diets, eating poison rodents and other predators who feed on them. But don't worry, there are other effective ways to eliminate rats without poisoning animals further up the food chain. Take away attractants, meaning pick up trash, shut and secure garbage lids, and don't free feed your pets outside. You can also use live or instant kill traps. And my personal favorite, encouraging natural predators. Rodents are the primary choice for birds of prey like owls. You can encourage them to do your rodent control by installing nest boxes in perches. And officials are even making changes as well. The Environmental Protection Agency has banned rat poisons with the most toxic and persistent pesticides from consumers, but they are available for commercial use. In 2021, the state of California took it a step further, forming a new law banning most rat poison usages. So the next time you see a rat or mouse scurrying across the street, it may serve as a reminder of the delicate balance we need to strike between controlling pests and protecting our environment. Tanner Saw, Scripps News. Well, can't see much now because of the uh, clouds and snow, but we are big sky country for a reason. And recently we were treated to quite the spectacle in the night sky. 
with a great viewing of the Northern Lights. But why did we get such a good front row seat? MTN's Eric Johnson explains. The Aurora Borealis, otherwise known as the Northern Lights, is one of the most mesmerizing phenomena in the night sky, and many Montanans had the chance to view it the last two nights. I captured this photo in the Fort Benton area on Tuesday night, but why do these lights exist? It all starts with the sun. The Earth is surrounded by magnetic fields, and the sun emits charged particles, or protons and electrons, which travel towards Earth courtesy of the solar wind at speeds of 250 to 500 miles per second. During solar storms, large masses of these particles reach the magnetic fields and are funneled towards areas with the highest magnetic activity, the North and South Poles. Upon reaching the poles, these particles interact with gases in the atmosphere. The collisions with the already present particles causes heat, which is then released in the form of light. The color seen is going to depend on the height at which the collision occurs. Higher altitude oxygen creates a red hue, while the more commonly seen green hue is created by lower altitude oxygen molecules. The pink and blue hues correlate to nitrogen molecules, the most abundant gas in our atmosphere. To view the aurora borealis at mid-latitudes like Montana, the solar storm needs to be particularly intense as brightness directly relates to the intensity of the solar storm. While it is not an exact science, the KP index measures geomagnetic activity and is the best indicator of a solar storm's strength. A KP5 is generally seen as the threshold for a solar storm, and that's when the northern lights are usually visible near the Canadian border. A KP7 is considered a strong solar storm and typically leads to northern lights being visible at lower latitudes in the United States. These solar flare-ups that cause the aurora borealis can happen any time of the year, however, it is most common to catch the northern lights during winter time due to the shorter daylight hours. Now, if you are looking to keep track of geomagnetic activity, I'll provide some resources on my Facebook page, meteorologist Eric Johnson, and on our website. Reporting in Great Falls, Eric Johnson, MTN News. Well, that should just about do it for us here this week at MTN Outdoors. Thank you, as always, for spending a little time with me. And remember, send in those photos to andy.curtis at ktvh.com of you enjoying the great outdoors here in Montana, and you could see yourself at the end of a future episode. Just like these folks, it's time for this week's MTN Outdoors Brag Board. Well, this week's picture comes from Nick, and it was titled Fishing at the Gates. Looks like it was a pretty successful trip, judging by that trout front and center there, and a couple of smiles on those faces. Thanks for watching, and send in some more photos. All right, thanks again to everybody who sent in a picture, and remember, keep them coming to andy.curtis at ktvh.com, and you could see yourself at the end of a future episode. Until next week, stay safe, stay warm, and I'll see you out there.